All right. Looks like we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's exciting debate between two knowledgeable debaters, Paul Price and Mark Reed. Tonight, we are debating the important question, is there evidence for the existence of God? Paul says yes, and Mark says no. Both Paul and Mark are excellent debaters. I always appreciate the prep and hard work they put into each debate that they do on this channel. And they always come to these events prepared and ready to give us a debate to remember. So I'm excited for this. I know the audience is excited for this. Before we get into the opening statements, though, let's kind of break the ice, get to know our guests tonight a bit. And why don't we start with Mark? Mark, it's great to have you. Always a pleasure. How you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about your channel. Thank you, um, Donnie. That's uh, very kind of you. And and that, well, hello, everybody. I'm Mark Reed. I do debates, discussions. Um, I more roam around the internet searching for different ideas and different concepts and put them up to the scrutiny of logic and reason. Um, I, I really enjoy these kind of debates. I really enjoy engaging people that have vast disagreements with me, but I, I do like to keep a, a sort of modicum of respect. Um, so if you do like uh, debates and you're coming from a secular worldview, or even if you're not and want a different different worldview to see, um, you know, drop by the channel. Um, we're always, always open to people asking questions or um, engaging with us on things they disagree with. Mark, I appreciate that introduction to the audience. If you like what you're hearing from the debaters, Mark and Paul, make sure to check the description box for the relevant links to their channels and Paul, for you, your podcast. So Paul, it's great to have you back as well. You were here about a month ago debating the same topic, always a fun topic, a very important one, the existence of God debate. So how have you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about the podcast that you're running. Yes, uh, doing well. Uh, thanks as always, Donnie, for having me on. And it's always a, a great joy and a pleasure uh, to get to come on and, and just participate in these debates um, and join the starting down here in, uh, in Georgia. We're starting to get some spring weather. So that's nice. I don't know if that's uh, true where you guys are, but uh, of course, Mark's on the other side of the total different hemisphere, so he's probably going the opposite direction with the uh, with the seasons. But in any case, um, I'm definitely looking forward to this debate because I think um, just based on having listened to uh, previous debates that Mark has done, I'm really excited to hear his perspective, and it, it sounds like he's going to I have a lot of good, um, you know, sort of more academic and logical arguments to bring to the table. So I'm certainly looking forward to it. Uh, I, in the past, I was a professional in the world of Christian apologetics, um, but that is not the case anymore. I'm not here representing any organization. My opinions are my own. And I'm going to add another disclaimer here because we are now living in a time when uh, Maybe this doesn't necessarily go without saying, but no uh, AI or uh, chat GPT was used in the preparation of my statements today. So 100% uh, real, uh, non-computer generated responses. All right, Paul, I appreciate the introduction there. And I'll say it one more time to the audience. Please do check the description box for the links where you can find more from Mark and Paul. So correct me if I'm wrong, tonight the debate format is the Lincoln-Douglas debate format. And so we are going to be starting with Paul from Uncensored <clears throat> Pilgrims with the affirmative constructive, and that is going to be 15 minutes. So Paul, we are going to uh, hand it over to you. Whenever you're ready, I'll start your timer. All right. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Well, I'm excited, like I said, to get started with this debate. And in tonight's debate, we will again be discussing the question, is there evidence for God? And I know many of the audience here tonight will have just watched me debate this same topic with Taylor last month. So uh, just to avoid uh, boring everyone, I am going to try to develop a bit on my opening remarks uh, tonight 
rather than just simply uh, stating the exact same thing that I did last time. But in my previous debate, I talked about the problem of divine hiddenness, uh, which isn't really a problem in a logical sense, uh, but in an emotional sense. It can feel like a problem. We feel like we should be able uh, to see God at any time, whenever we want. And that, in fact, is the future uh, that God promises to those who love him and seek him. But since we can't see God now, uh, I made an analogy about a detective on a crime scene uh, looking for evidence of a home break-in and an irrational judge who refused to accept that detective's evidence. So tonight, I'd like to ask you to revisit that analogy with me a second time, uh, because I still think that there's a, a good bit we can learn from thinking about that scenario. Let's imagine that you, as the detective, have gone out, you've collected your evidence from the crime scene, um, and you are presenting your evidence again to the judge. The judge refuses your evidence again, but this time he gives a specific reason. He refuses to accept your evidence because your claim that a burglary happened is not falsifiable, and uh, the idea of a home burglary is not testable or repeatable. So, to make a long story short, falsification means that there is an experimental result that you could produce that would uh, prove your theory false. In past debates on this topic, my opponent Mark uh, has made many appeals to the scientific method. Uh, but the scientific method does not apply to all types of questions, uh, but rather to a specific subset of science called operational science. Operational science deals with understanding the ongoing operation of nature, uh, principles like the gravitational constant or the boiling point of water, for example. We can come to understand these things through repeated experimentation which gives us predictable results. And that is the e uh, essence of the scientific method. However, the judge in our story is rather confused because when dealing with questions of history or origins, we are manifestly outside the realm of the scientific method. The type of science that we're doing as a detective goes by many different names, such as uh, forensic science or historical science or origins science. But whatever you call it, the important thing to understand is that history is not testable in the same way that uh, natural laws are testable. There's no test kit that you can go and buy at the store to see if a home was robbed last night. In fact, there's no way to logically prove any claim about the past with certainty. In my last debate, I explained that science works on the principle of induction or inductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning is what we use in uh, operational science. But in historical science, we use something called abductive reasoning, which means inference to the best explanation. We must look at the overall set of evidence available to us and decide on the best explanation for that evidence. We cannot test or repeat the past because we only have access to the present. When atheists try to use the scientific method against God, which, by the way, was invented by a Christian Bible believer named Francis Bacon, they're committing what the late Dr. Greg Bonson once called the crackers in the pantry fallacy. They're acting like uh, all questions are investigated in the same way that you would check to see if there are any crackers left in your pantry, just by going and opening the door and looking to see if there are any crackers. Atheists look up at the sky and they look down in their microscopes and they don't see God. And from that, they conclude that God does not exist. Just like you would open up your pantry door, look in, and if you didn't see any crackers, you would think, hmm, I must be out of crackers. Uh, but you see, that's just not how historical science works. And we do not use the scientific method to try to answer the question, does God exist? Instead, we look at the evidence we have available to us and we make an inference to the best explanation. My opponent Mark once stated in a previous debate, if you're eliminating possibilities without good reason, your method of gathering evidence is not rigorous. And I happen to agree, 
Uh, but there's only one problem. That is exactly what atheists are doing all the time. They are disqualifying God as an explanation from the outset, and this guarantees that they will always arrive at their desired conclusion. That's why Lynn Margulis, uh, the evolutionary biologist who was once married to Carl Sagan, uh, had stated at, at, in one interview that she did that the creationists are right in their criticisms of evolution. It's just that they don't have any alternatives that are quote-unquote scientific. By defining God as unscientific, they uh, are rigging the game, in effect. Uh, heads I win, tails you lose. Uh, Mark in the past has attempted to buttress this heads I win, tails you lose gambit uh, with the claim that you cannot solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. In other words, since God is mysterious, we are supposedly not allowed to believe that God did anything. William Lynn Craig has responded uh, very effectively to this sort of thinking uh, when he said that in order for something to be the best explanation, we do not need to have an explanation of that explanation. Otherwise, this would lead us into an infinite regress of explanations. For example, let's say someone asked me how my computer came to be. And I might respond, uh, a computer engineer made it. Now, a consistent atheist might say to that, well, you, you cannot claim that uh, an engineer made your computer because you don't know anything about that alleged engineer. You don't know the engineer's name. You don't know where they're from. And you can't explain to me how they actually did it. Is that a reasonable way to behave? Obviously, the mere fact that God is mysterious does not prevent us from believing rationally that God exists on the basis of the evidence. I also need to address another statement that was made in previous debates by my opponent, uh, and he has unfortunately chosen to repeat a very strange and self-defeating uh, statement that crops up I've seen uh, in atheist circles from time to time. The statement that, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable. Now let's think about this claim for just a second. What is eyewitness testimony? Simply put, it is what people say about what they've experienced. So uh, Mark would like to downplay the importance of eyewitness testimony while encouraging us to use the scientific method, uh, at least if his, if his prior statements are any guide. Uh, but what do we need in order to record the results of experiments done using the scientific method? Why, eyewitnesses, of course. If eyewitness testimony is unreliable, then so too is all of experimental science. Mark has stated, police, have, uh, police know that uh, eyewitness testimony is unreliable. But this boils down to saying, police have witnessed the fact that witnesses are unreliable. But if that's true, how can we trust the witness of the police either? It's obviously a self-defeating claim on many levels. And the ultimate motive behind the atheist attempt to downplay eyewitnesses is, of course, to try to render useless some of the most powerful evidence for the Christian worldview, which is the eyewitness testimony of the Gospels. J. Warner Wallace is an actual police detective, and he wrote a book that I'd highly recommend called Cold Case Christianity. And in that book, he explains how police detectives are able to piece together the truth by interviewing eyewitnesses and comparing their reports to one another. Not all people are truthful, and not all eyewitness reports are equally trustworthy. But to claim that all eyewitness testimony is unreliable is just silly. And hopefully we can get past that kind of, of thinking going forward. So now that I've clarified what sort of methodology is applicable to our debate, I will give a summary of the evidences that I'll be putting forth uh, for the existence of God. If God does exist, uh, I would expect to see evidence that God created something. And we do have that evidence, and I'm going to give two examples, the universe or nature and life. Secondly, if God exists, I would expect that God would communicate with us in some way. And we have that evidence as well. God has given us the scriptures, and those scriptures include fulfilled prophecies. To defend his claim that there is no evidence for God, my opponent Mark will need to show that all three of my evidences are invalid, 
And in addition, uh, he will need to explain exactly what sort of evidence he has personally been searching for and failing to find, leading him to the conclusion that God does not exist. So evidence one is the universe, and this is the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, it's a straightforward deductive argument. So if my opponent wishes to challenge the conclusion, his only rational course is to attack one or more of these two premises. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. And two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Now, the cause of the universe cannot be a part of the universe. Otherwise, we would just be saying that the universe caused itself, and that would be illogical. So that means that whatever caused this universe would have to be outside of time or eternal and non-physical. So the second piece I'm going to bring up is life itself. And life coming into existence out of non-life, or abiogenesis, is perhaps the greatest stumbling block of all for naturalist attempts to explain everything without reference to God. There's simply no way for such a thing to happen for a myriad of different reasons. And the situation is so hopeless that most educated atheists today will frankly admit that we have no idea how life originated. There's a long history of failed experiments in the field of abiogenesis, uh, the most famous of which is probably the Miller-Urey experiment. And no one has ever managed to get a living cell to self-arrange out of non-living matter. In 2018, a peer-reviewed paper was published by a total of 33 different co-authors representing 23 different institutions across 12 countries. And this was called Cause of Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or Cosmic. In this paper, Steele et al. write, modern ideas of abiogenesis in hydrothermal vents or elsewhere on the primitive earth have developed into sophisticated conjectures with little or no evidential support. They go so far as to suggest that panspermia must be the answer. Life must have come to earth from outer space since there's no reasonable way to think that it could have popped into existence uh, here on this planet by sheer chance. Now, my opponent, Mark, has once stated, and, and I think reasonably, that claims made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. I wonder, will my opponent act in accordance with his own standard and dismiss the claim of abiogenesis, or will he cling to a belief in abiogenesis by faith? The third piece is fulfilled prophecy, as I mentioned. And uh, the historical events of the New Testament Gospels were foretold by the Hebrew prophet Isaiah around 800 years before Christ and by King David about a thousand years before Christ. Isaiah 52 to 53 and Psalm 22 both clearly describe the mission and ultimate fate of Jesus Christ. Now, the New Testament Gospel of Mark uh, is attested by our earliest witnesses, such as Papias. Uh, to be Mark's record of Peter's testimony and gospel. Mark was Peter's interpreter. So when we read Mark, we're really reading the gospel of Peter. One minute. Uh, this gospel can be dated as early as 45 AD, and certainly no later than 70 AD, uh, which is just about when uh, the Romans invaded and destroyed the temple at Jerusalem. So if you read Peter's letters, specifically in 2 Peter 1.16, he tells us he was an eyewitness to the events of Jesus' life and death. And we know further that Peter was willing to go to a torturous death himself at the hands of the Romans, being crucified upside down in Rome, rather than to recant his testimony. Men do not die for what they know to be a hoax. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much for that 15-minute opening statement or affirmative constructive. We're now moving into a five-minute cross-examination where the negative, being Mark Reed, will ask Paul, being the affirmative, questions. Go ahead, gentlemen. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so it's my question time, is that correct? Yes, you get five minutes. Excellent. Fantastic. Okay, so when you say that divine hiddenness is a thing, do you then acknowledge there is a lack of evidence for God because it is hidden? 
No, uh, when I say divine hiddenness, I don't mean that the evidence for God is hidden, but I mean that God himself is hidden. We don't have the ability to just look out our window and just see God up in the up in the sky or or whatever. He's hidden to us in a direct sense. Um, when you say sort of this irrational judge thing you've got, that you are saying that the crime was committed by someone, if you see a broken window, how do you know it's a someone and not a something that did that damage? You wouldn't, not, not without other uh, pieces of evidence to go with it. That's why uh, what I stated is that in, in forensic science, what we need is abductive reasoning. So we need to look at the overall picture of evidence that we have and look at what is the best explanation for that overall picture. Um, with the, the scientific method, um, do you acknowledge that even if you're not using the scientific method, you need at least a methodology that is reliable? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, why is it when people sort of give eyewitness testimony to the police, do their accounts vary with such uh, a sort of to such a degree? Why is that? Well, because, you know, if you imagine people and, and a lot of times we're talking about, you know, a crime being committed in a public place or something like that. So, you know, things might be happening quickly. Uh, people might be scared for their lives and taking cover. You know, there's lots of reasons why they might uh, in, in a time of crisis, like a, a time of, of a crime being committed that the police are uh, questioning them about. Uh, there are different reasons why they might have misheard or misseen something in that situation. And there's also situations where people have a motive to be dishonest. And so all of those things have to be taken into account. But by comparing different eyewitnesses to one another and by assessing the reliability of an evidence and, and seeing, you know, does this person have a motive to make up a fake story, for example, uh, that's how police are able to put together a, a total picture of evidence that incorporates eyewitness testimony. Okay. And so if we're going to use sort of um, holy books and religious books in um, evaluating historical science, why don't we take the same level of uh, weight to other holy books like the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita and all of the other holy books throughout the world? Well, I, I mean, I think you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So you, when you bring up the Quran, you know, the Quran is, is uh, ultimately the product of an individual who says that they had a supernatural experience with an angel in a cave. And I actually believe that's true. I, I believe that, that Muhammad did have a supernatural experience. Now, when it comes to that, uh, if you read the, um, the Hadith, um, there's actually a testimony in there about, uh, and it comes from one of Muhammad's many wives uh, by the name of Aisha, who actually states that uh, his first, um, like the first reaction that Muhammad had to his experience was that he thought he had seen a demon. And actually, if you read Muhammad's account, that fits with what happened. He was physically attacked by an angel who told him in, a, in an aggressive way to write down what I'm about to tell you. He was afraid for his life. So, um, you know, when it comes to that story, I, I believe there is a an underlying seed of truth there. I do believe a supernatural thing very plausibly did happen to Muhammad. I just don't uh, agree with the uh, Muslim interpretation that it was a an angel from God, I believe it was a fallen angel. When you look at other texts you mentioned, uh, you know, they're way, way after the events. They're not eyewitness testimonies. Uh, wasn't the Bible written after the events? Are they contemporary to Jesus's life? Uh, they are written within the living memory of the eyewitnesses. They are not written, you know, hundreds or thousands of years later, like, you know, the Vedas or uh, the the Buddhist scriptures, Bhagavad Gita, things like that. Those are way, way after. Whereas the Bible the was written of... very plausibly Sorry. by the eyewitnesses. One more question. Mormon written within the person's life. What's that? 
wasn't the Book of Mormon written within the person's same, life? Why don't same, we provide yeah. equal testimony to that one? Yeah, I, I would give you a very similar response to what I told you about Muhammad. Uh, Joseph Smith was someone that is known to have been involved in a lot of occult practices. And I do believe it's very plausible that he had an experience with an angel, like he says. But again, if you look at the evidence of what that angel told him, it does not match up with the previous revelation we have in the Bible. So I would interpret that as a fallen angel as well. Gentlemen, great first cross-examination. The five minutes, as usual, flies by. And so we have now completed the affirmative constructive and the first cross-examination. We're now moving into the negative constructive, which would be Mark Reed. And that also includes the first negative rebuttal. You've got 18 minutes, Mark, whenever you're ready. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Donnie. Um, so evidence for God. Um, so in order to present a case for something being true in reality, a, a, an evaluation must be made with good evidence free of bias and personal interpretation. Um, this leads to question what makes something evidence? And the whole idea of evidence is reliant on the method that is used to gather it. Why um, in, in crime scene analysis, method the method you use to gather it is very, very important. There must be a chain of evidence that is, that is uh, uh, preserved. Um, so let's go through some of the things that makes evidence uh, evidence, basically. Well, what is evidence? Um, for the, the first thing is, is kind of obvious. Evidence must be evident. It must be able to be observed. Spectral evidence, personal anecdotes, or, or a phenomena that can't be demonstrated is not good evidence. An example of this is hearsay in criminal court. That which cannot be demonstrated to others is not evident, and therefore it's not good evidence. Um, it must be robust. Now, robustness refers to the evidence being repeatable and reliable by all people that observe. For instance, everybody witnesses the same event. They all have the same story. Um, for instance, if anyone drops something, everyone will get the same evidence of gravity. Yet the, the methodology of religious beliefs has hundreds of thousands of separate conclusions that are all contradictory to one another. Robustness means that the evidence should point to one conclusion consistently, no matter who is evaluating it. And even within one religion, there are thousands of different interpretations of the same um, text and the same book. This is not reliable evidence. It must be rigorous. Rigor refers to taking into account all possible explanations. The problem with religion is that it uses special pleading for its own religion while rejecting all others and all other possibilities. Even though other religions generally have the same claims and the same level of evidence for them, an inability to take into account all possible conclusions leads to something called confirmation bias. It means that you only acknowledge the evidence that agrees with you and dismiss all everything that disagrees with you. Uh, good evidence is credible. This means we know where the evidence has been sourced and how it has been gathered. Um, again, this relates to the crime scene. You need to have a chain of evidence. This is related to a good methodology of gathering the evidence. Has it been sourced from reliable sources? Could it have been misinterpreted? Could a wrong conclusion have been drawn? This directly ties to the credibility of the people gathering that evidence. So bad evidence, evidence that's not credible, obviously. Unknown sources, story, mythology, religious beliefs and not good evidence as we do not know who observed what, what is hyperbole, what is literal, and everything in holy books is absolutely hearsay. Different holy books say different things. So the theist must use special pleading to argue that their particular holy book is a special case and discount all of the others written. Personal testimony is unreliable and contradictory. If we take the Christian's testimony, why should we not take the Hindu testimony as well? Why should we not take people that have seen aliens' testimony? Why should we not take people who have seen Bigfoot's testimony? If we attribute equal weight to them without confirmation bias, a lot of them will contradict one another. The police are well aware of how unreliable witness evidence is, which is why they prefer to rely on scientific or forensic evidence, which unfortunately we cannot seem to find for God. Now, another 
uh, in, uh, example of bad evidence is a post hoc ergo prompter hoc. This is essentially because one event follows another, then the first event calls the second. This correlation of events does not necessarily mean that the first event caused the second. The only way we can establish causal relationship is through replication of the event and see if the second event follows. And um, another, another type of really bad evidence is affirming the consequent. And I've already heard some of it come out uh, already in the debate. Affirming the consequent is basically making an assumption and then confirming it through what you would expect to see if the assumption is true. So what Paul's doing is saying, if God exists, then we should see the universe. A universe exists, therefore God. This is a logical fallacy and the worst kind of evidence as it lacks the rigor of taking all possible causes into account. You could use the same argument saying, um, if, 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 if the fairies are true, then the universe would exist. The universe exists, therefore fairies that created the universe is true. This could be done for any number of things. And it is only special pleading that is applied to a God and the worst kind of uh, confirmation bias. So problems with the God hypothesis. There's no evidence of any mind without a brain. In fact, due to our current knowledge of neuron synapses and how the neuros nervous system works, my opponent must present some form of evidence that a mind can in fact exist without a brain that is normally required. Any assertion that a mind exists sans brain must be supported by some sort of evidence that this can even be possible, much less is the fact of reality. The problem of evil. Even if we discount actions, uh, you know, actions that rely on free will by people, there are natural evils like bacteria, viruses, volcanoes, and other natural disasters that are an act of God. A benevolent, omnipotent, omnipotent God could stop these things without violating free will, but does not. It beggars belief that an on, omnipotent God would allow meteorites to strike his or her favorite planet, yet do nothing about it. It is a massive problem for theists that an apparently benevolent God would create a parasite that burrows into children's eyes, causing them to go blind. Um, the next part of evidence I have is the vastness of the universe. The Earth appears to be the only place humans have developed on, yet the universe is so vast we have trouble looking into the, the vastness of space. Why create a massive hostile universe for organisms that only apply one moat in one galaxy of that massive universe? Why create sites in distant galaxies that no one will ever see or observe? This is a highly unlikely state of affairs for any intelligent being to design, much less supposedly the most intelligent being that has ever existed. Now, I do want to go into um, some of the things that Paul went through and some of the problems that, that, that he's kind of brought up. Um, the evidence that I require isn't necessarily uh, the scientific methodology, even though that is probably the most reliable way we have to evaluate the world. But in some way, you have to show that your, method, your methodology has that reliability and rigorousness. Um, if you uh, have a methodology for crossing the road, for instance, you know, you just cross the road. You don't expect, you expect to have a reliable method for telling if there's cars coming. You don't just take it on faith or just assume that because you've seen cars in the past, there's cars there. We have to have this methodology in order to determine what is true and what isn't. This isn't a scientific method, but it is a methodology that works. And I will guarantee you that Paul does use induction in his day-to-day -day life. Even though he says there's a problem with induction, he uses induction. And even if he attributes induction to a god, the problem is that he's still using, he's still, sorry, verifying that that god is providing induction consistently by using induction. God doesn't get you around the problem of induction. It just means that you're relying on induction to judge that your god is consistently providing it. So he's in the same boat as everybody else, even though he doesn't realize it. Um, how does he know God's consistent? Induction, which is what he's using um, to, to demonstrate God. And it's what he's basically saying works because of God. He's not out of the loop. Um, unfortunately, he's got the same um, circular argument as everybody else. Um, so a few things that I want to go through. He mentioned Mark, which is interesting because we know that the, the, at the end of Mark, there's things that have been added that were not in earlier versions of the Bible. Um, things like handling snakes, being immune to poison, talking in tongues. There are early versions of Mark without these things in it. So we know that it was added later. And the problem is we do not have the originals. 
we don't. No, no scholar would ever claim that we had the have the originals of the, the Bible. So the problem comes, what else was added? We don't know. Uh, Bart Ehrman famously did, a, did an entire talk on that. We don't know which stories were added and which weren't. Um, it's a problem. But um, really what, what it happens is they just assume all of it is correct, which lacks that rigor of are there other possibilities? Um, he wanted to ask whether I thought abiogenesis was true. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But um, there, there are multiple steps that we've sorted out on what abiogenesis would be, which is more than we have for the process of how God supposedly created life. We don't have any of the steps of how God created life. We do for abiogenesis, so I think that is more likely. But I don't know that's a true... He brought up panspermia. Why could that not be a possibility? I don't know what caused life. Um, but the problem is that just because I don't know what caused life, just because we have a gap doesn't mean your God gets to fill it. You need evidence for your God creating that life, not just saying, hey, well, you don't know, so I'm going to insert my God. That could not be more God of the gaps if you it wore a God of the gaps hat and went in a God of the gaps parade through the street. That is essential God of the gaps or the argument from ignorance, as it's also called. Um, um, and the Kalam, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is the universe had a cause. I don't know that the universe began to exist. There are scientists that say that the universe could be eternal and, and that space-time before the Big Bang, before the Big Bang may be a nonsensical statement. If the universe is comprised of space-time and space-time originated with the Big Bang, then it is feasible that the first second could have stretched to an eternity. That's just the reality of the situation. And if the universe is eternal, then it doesn't need a cause. It just is. So that defeats his argument straight away. Um, but the Kalam doesn't actually mention a God in any of the premises or the conclusion. It just says it has a cause. How do we know that it wasn't a natural cause in the larger cosmos or a multiverse or any of the other hypotheses that we have? Just because we don't know how the universe started if it started at all, and we don't know how it could be eternal, if it is, doesn't mean you get to insert your God, which is currently what Paul is doing. He is searching for a gap in knowledge in which to assert the God. Um, um, yeah, and the whole idea that there's universe and life, I think I mentioned it early, earlier, that that is just um, ass a, a, assuming the consequence. It's basically saying if, if there's a God that created the universe and life, universe and life exists, therefore God. No, you have to demonstrate that it was, in fact, the universal life. And that sort of brings me to the, to the break-in because I think that's fascinating because you're begging the question to say that there was an agent that broke in, right? We don't know that that house was broken in or there was a God involved. Paul is just an, trying to make an analogy that asserts that God already exists, that it is a house that's been broken to, and it's not just a window that's been shattered by a natural phenomenon like a like a tree, um, you know, hitting it or something like that. Or, you know, he's automatically assuming the God to begin with. That's where it falls down. He's got to demonstrate that it is, in fact, a God before he starts to postulate that. So you can't assume it was a break-in. You have to say, we find broken glass, we find things in disarray, what could it be and go from there? You don't automatically assume it's a break-in. It may not be. But he's begging the question by saying, yes, it is a break-in. It was a thinking agent. Therefore, it must be a god. And, and that's where he's sort of front-end loading it. Um, yeah, eyewitness testimony. I, 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 I don't know how he's going to basically say that eyewitness testimony is reliable. We can give eyewitness testimony for fairies and, and you know, um, um, Bigfoot and aliens and um, rocks that are, are, are organs. People have all kinds of weird beliefs that they truly believe and, and they provide eyewitness testimony for it. Why are we saying that some eyewitness testimony, the one that we agree with, is reliable, and then the eyewitness testimony we disagree with is unreliable? 
we must treat them with all the same weight when we are trying to find answers. But unfortunately, Paul doesn't want to do that. He wants to provide the weight to his eyewitnesses and say everybody else's eyewitnesses aren't, aren't very reliable at all, which is not a rigorous and, and good way to find evidence because, of course, you will get confirmation bias. You will get the evidence that you're looking for when you proceed to find evidence like this. That is in human nature. Um, and, um, yeah, again, I'll just reiterate, divine hiddenness is not evidence for a God. It's evidence against a God. If there is a God, because so a, a, a divinely hidden being is totally indistinguishable, completely indistinguishable from one that doesn't exist, right? There, there's no, if you're saying, well, we don't observe him, we don't see him, he's not evident because he's hiding. A God that doesn't exist will not be evident as well. And so we can't say that a divinely hidden being is evident. It's, it's like an argument that says, because we don't have evidence for this, that is evidence of itself because it's divinely hidden. No, that is a post hoc rationalization that's saying, we can't find evidence. How do I explain this away? Oop, divinely hidden. You shouldn't expect to find evidence. And the thing is that we should expect to find evidence if there is a God. If God is doing miracles, which Paul has said in a previous debate that God is currently doing miracles, we should be able to find evidence of that. We should be able to see things happen in physics if it has any impact on the physical world, which miracles are supposed to impact the physical world. They're supposed to be things that could not possibly happen by natural courses that impact the, the natural world. But instead of reliable evidence for this, all we get is personal anecdotes and, and, and random things. In the past, in the Bible, people have done miracles left, right and centre. There's people raising from the dead, there's pillars of fire, there's donkeys talking, there's all kinds of things going on. As our ability to investigate these things has gotten greater, the prevalence of them has lessened. That's not what we should expect. What we should expect is with greater investig investigative power, we should see and find more of these instances, not less. But we never do. Has, has God suddenly become camera shy? Are all the angels camera shy? Everybody carries a camera now. Suddenly angels aren't appearing to people. Angels aren't touching down on earth anymore. For some reason, they just... They don't like photos being taken, apparently. And you can sort of rationalise this away by, oh, you know, he's changed what he wants to do kind of thing. But why? If a God wants you to believe in him, why isn't he keeping up the, the vast multitude of miracles that he's been doing all this time? One if minute. A God, thank you. If a God truly wants this, why aren't these miracles occurring left, right and centre and we're just stupefied and science is stupefied by these miracles occurring all the time? But instead, we find this weak evidence based upon people's testimony, based upon things that we can't investigate, unfalsifiable um, stories and anecdotes. And, you know, we find con men in a fair amount of cases. James Randi, the sceptic, was famous for finding all kinds of, of con men. And the studies we've done on prayer shows that prayer doesn't work. It doesn't change any outcomes more than just chance. So where is the God? Where is it? Because it is not evidence. And that is the major attribute of evidence. It has to be evident to everybody, not just those using confirmation bias. Thank you. I'll, I'll save my time if I have any. Thank you very much, Mark Reed, for your... 18 minute negative constructive and the first negative rebuttal. So we're now moving into, and I've got Paul right here. We're now moving into the second cross examination where this time we have Paul in the affirmative asking Mark in the negative question. So gentlemen, the floor is yours. Five minutes. Yes. And I have to uh, apologize. I dropped out there. There was some type of my computer just flipped itself off. Uh, some oh. type of uh, 
fallen angel, fallen angel interruption or something. I don't know, but I don't think I can repeat that speech. I'll be honest with you. I don't no, no, know. I'm not sure I can remember. <laughs> I, what I, I, I only, I only missed maybe like what thirty to seconds to a minute of the of. Yeah, the Paul, you're okay. only. Yeah, it was only about thirty seconds. You dropped. Yeah, so, so, so you, I'm you all right. Not at all. Yeah, probably wasn't uh, important anyway. <laughs> Uh, so Mark, uh, first question for you, yep. and I, and I actually asked this question in my opening statement, but can you tell uh, me and also the audience watching tonight, what evidence you have personally been searching for and failing to find, uh, as it regards the existence of God, what, what evidence have you expected to see in the world that you do not see, therefore causing you to, to state that God doesn't exist? Um, well, I mean, I've already gone through a very, very specific criteria of evidence that I expect all of the attributes I would expect to see out of it, the rigorous robustness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we can in some way have a Damascus Road experience, for instance, for, for, for me, um, I would probably believe at that point um, or I'd at least investigate. And if I found it to be some sort of miracle, I, I would believe. But unfortunately, Damascus Road appearances are, are, are scarce these days. They've always been scarce. <laughs> uh, okay, so your answer, if I'm understanding, is a direct miracle God appearing to you personally. That is one piece of evidence you would expect to find if God existed, uh, sure. but you don't find it. Um, are there any? Okay, well, I'll lower the bar a bit. Get me a talking donkey. Okay, so if God existed, you would expect that you personally would have witnessed miracles in your lifetime. And since you have not witnessed them, you conclude God does not exist. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Well, it's not just that I haven't witnessed miracles. It's just the lack of evidence. And the evidence is so poor and the methodology for getting it so bad that um, I, I cannot I cannot rely on the evidence that's been presented. Right, there's right. there's that... nothing that's been presented that couldn't be applied to a, another half dozen religions out there, as well as flat earth and and um, 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 Bigfoot and fairies and all other possibilities of things out there. If you be intellectually consistent and give equal weight to the people presenting evidence, you find that none have solid, reliable evidence that they are presenting. Okay. Um that actually leads me to another one of the questions I wanted to ask. So um, on what basis do you make the claim that all religions are equal in terms of their evidential support? Um, I'm, you know, is that something where you've actually investigated individually all religions and you've concluded they're all equal? None of them have any edge over the other or anything like that? I have. Sorry, I have I have investigated the, the major religions. I wouldn't say every religion because that's you know a, a lot of religions kind of thing. Um, but they all make roughly the same claims. That's the thing, and um, even though they vary a bit, it's all all the same claims that they're making, and they all claim that each other are wrong. They all say, "Hey, we've got it right. You've got it wrong." If you take that at face value. It's impossible because they're all contradictory. Well, one of them um, could be uh, right, right? I mean, they, they can't all be right, but it's possible that one yes. could be right, correct? That's possible, sure. Yeah. Um, do you believe, and I think, let me let me, let me me set this up. So as I, as I see it, we are in a trilemma type of situation as it, as it, as it uh, regards abiogenesis, okay? We're in a trilemma. You can either choose to believe in supernatural origin of life, or you can believe in abiogenesis, or you could believe in panspermia. Am I missing? Am I missing anything? Is there any other possibility, or is that does that cover all possible origins of life? Either abiogenesis, panspermia, or supernatural creation. Um, is there any other option? Is there any other option? Uh, time traveling wormhole from the future. It's cyclic. Would so you wouldn't count that as as supernatural? Well, wormholes are natural. So you're calling that an option that is not 
abiogenesis or panspermia? Right. So you believe you believe them. you believe in like like the sliders or the uh Oh no, I don't believe that. I mean, okay. But I mean, even logically, I'm not sure that that possibility would stand up because you're saying one final that, question, Paul. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me just, I'll just finish the remaining time I have, just go ahead and answer the, the question. So reasonably, did I cover all the options there? Supernatural, abiogenesis, or panspermia? Yeah, there could be other options that we're unaware of, though. For but origin. you're not aware of any, though. I'm not aware of any, okay. no. Apart from, you know, that's and the do you take a position? Do but you take a position? The whole point. Well, just let me finish. The whole point of a trilemma is it exhausts all other possibilities. So yeah. you can't really say that a trilemma exhausts all possibilities if if there's another another thing, even even if that's you know unlikely or you think it's impossible, um, not logically impossible, but practically impossible. It, it's trilemma doesn't hold. Well, okay, uh, gentlemen, we'll have to wrap it up there. I know time flies by. Five minutes goes by yes, quick. It does. Five five minutes flies by. <laughs> Great questions, great back and forth from the both of you. Very professional debate so far. And we are moving along smoothly. We are now moving into the first affirmative rebuttal. And for this section, we've got eight minutes on the clock. Paul, Paul Price, you being in, in the affirmative tonight, the floor is yours for eight minutes. Go ahead. Absolutely. I think personally, this is the hardest part of the debate because uh, there's so much that that has been said that you know can be responded to but how do you pick the exact right thing so uh, hopefully i will make some sense here uh because i did take some notes while uh mark was speaking here um and i think the first order of business here is for me to try to go back and explain my my analogy a bit more or i guess make it a little bit a little bit more explicit when i'm using this analogy of the irrational judge and the detective and the point that I'm trying to make there is that um, when we're looking at, at a historical event, we that is fundamentally different than if we are doing repeatable scientific tests on the laws of nature to get predictable experimental results. So using abductive reasoning, we have to look at the overall scope of evidence available to us. And from there, we, um, you know, we arrive at a conclusion uh, based on that evidence. So Mark has stated that I'm simply assuming God is the solution, whereas in reality, I am using abductive reasoning. I'm making an inference to God. Uh, Mark has stated that my arguments are based on ignorance, whereas uh, what I gave were arguments based very much on what we do know. Uh, and I gave lots of examples of what we do know and how that leads us to the conclusion that God exists. The best I can tell, um, the, the way that Mark is setting up his sort of evidential paradigm makes it impossible by definition for Mark to accept God as an explanation for anything. And when I directly asked Mark what evidence he's been looking for, I, I didn't really get convinced that... Um, he had fully understood the, the fact that by, by answering me in terms of a miracle, he's saying there is nothing that would, that would count as evidence for him other than a direct miracle directly to him from God. Anything else, it seems, is impossible, uh, according to his methodology, to count as evidence for God. And if that doesn't show that God is being ruled out a priori, uh, then I don't know what would. Um, basically, Mark is saying, uh, like Lynn Margulis said, that God is just an unscientific answer. But see, we can't we can't just play little word games like that. There's no there's no uh, justifiable reason to rule God out as an explanation. Instead, let's look at the evidence. So the fact that nobody and Mark Mark said exactly what I uh, you know suggested. You know, he doesn't really want to take a position. On abiogenesis, he doesn't want to nail himself down on how life originated. He seemed to be open to panspermia or abiogenesis, but the one answer he's not open to is divine creation. And so I'm just curious why that is. 
uh, why it seems that for Mark, it is impossible for any evidence to point to God's existence. If, uh, you know, the repeated failed experiments in abiogenesis are not sufficient to uh, show us that life doesn't just self-assemble, I don't know what would be. I mean, it, if if Mark wants us to use uh, falsifiability as a criterion, well, I've got news. Abiogenesis is not falsifiable in a, in a strict sense. Uh, you can always claim it happened. Uh, but I would like to hold Mark to his own standard. Evident, uh, claims that are made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So let's dismiss the claim of abiogenesis. There's simply no evidence for it. And panspermia is in the same bo boat because it is the only evidence for panspermia is circular. Well, life exists. Uh, so it had to come here from outer space. It can't have been created by God, obviously. So let's say that it came here from outer space. Uh, so I think you can see the problem. Now, Mark has used the word hearsay on several occasions. I got to correct the record here. Hearsay is when somebody in court says, somebody else said something to me. I didn't witness it, but I'm just repeating what somebody else told me. That's hearsay. What we have in the Gospels is eyewitness testimony, and that is not hearsay. It is evidence admissible in a court of law, and it's very good evidence, especially since we know that Peter was not willing to uh, recant his testimony, even under the pain of death by crucifixion. Mark brought out the issues surrounding the quote-unquote long ending of Mark, where there are certain scholars who claim that Mark uh, has some additions to it in the ending. And that debate is really outside the realm of, of this topic tonight, especially since the issues that I brought up have nothing to do with that extended ending of Mark. Uh, what we're talking about is the crucifixion of Jesus and how that itself is a fulfilled prophecy from Isaiah 52 to 53 and Psalm 22. So uh, we don't need to, to talk about the long ending of Mark to understand uh, Peter, Peter's testimony, which he died for, is that he saw Jesus crucified and even Bart Ehrman is not going to deny that Jesus was crucified. Well, go back and read the prophecies, Isaiah 52 to 53, Psalm 22. These are clear descriptions of a uh, not only what Jesus came to do, but the way that he was ultimately murdered was, uh, you know, put forth in a very clear way uh, hundreds of years prior to that fulfillment. So I'm not sure if Mark, you know, is actually trying to advance the claim that Jesus was not crucified, but that's certainly not a claim that any historians uh, of any rep, rep, uh, repute would agree with. Um, let's see. Not sure. Let's see. Uh, OK, Mark brought up the vastness of space as if this is an argument against God. I would turn that around. If space were not vast, what would that say about God? Uh, would would Mark suddenly believe in God if if God did not display his creative power in creating a vast cosmos for us to look up and see with our telescopes? Uh, if, if this were a small cosmos with just one solar system, would that increase the likelihood of God's existence somehow? I don't I don't see how it would. Uh, meteorites. I'm not sure how meteorites hitting the earth disproves God or or really counts as evidence against God. But I will bring up the fact that God created a solar system full of giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn that absorb the vast majority of uh, potential meteorites that would hit Earth. So to me, that shows One evidence minute. of design rather than a lack of design there. Diseases are a result of the fall. That's kind of Christianity 101. God did not create parasites and diseases from the beginning. Those are part of the curse which, were, which was brought about because of the rebellion of mankind. So um, I think that's all I'm going to have time for in this section. But thank you, for, thank you for your attention there on that. Paul, thank you very much for that eight-minute rebuttal. We are now handing it over to Mark. And Mark has his negative rebuttal. With Mark being in the negative tonight, you have 10 minutes rather than eight, Mark. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you, Donnie. So the, the irrational judge sort of analogy that he's being made, I, th I think 
Paul's missing the point that a detective's only involved once you know that a thinking agent is involved in that crime. Um, if if the window is broken accidentally or by natural causes, there is no crime, there is no detective involved. So again, I'll just reiterate, he's begging the question because he's already saying a thinking agent is involved, not natural causes. Um, so his, his analogy is flawed. It's a false analogy because we, at, at the start of the premise, what, what me and Paul agree on is that, we're, that, that um, I don't know what could have created the universe. I don't know, and I keep repeating that. Um, we, Because we don't know, it's more analogous to just there is disorder in a house and what is the reason? Could a dog have gotten loose? Could, could something else have happened? Why does it have to be a thinking agent involved up front and begging the question? It's because Paul wants there to be a thinking agent involved. He wants his analogy to already confirm the thinking agent is involved and we have to find him. So it is a poor analogy. Um, and, and I'm not sure Paul misunderstood me when I said an argument from ignorance. I'm not saying that his arguments are based on ignorance, as you said. I'm saying that his arguments are based on my ignorance of what caused life and the universe. That is what God of the Gaps is. So I'm not calling Paul an ignorant in any way. I'm saying that I am ignorant of those facts. I don't know what caused the universe, but you can't insert a God when, when I don't know. You need evidence for that God, and you can't just insert it because I don't know. And that's essentially what he's doing. Um, you know, he said it's impossible for God to be the explanation. So essentially he's saying it's impossible for a God to demonstrate himself to me. I don't know why that should be the case. I don't know why God would be constrained from demonstrating himself to me. I mean, God appeared to Paul and did all kinds of things to convince people in the past. Um, you know, that shows that it's not impossible for God to do so. And I might add that he also didn't violate those people's free will. They could choose to follow him or not choose to follow him. Their free will wasn't interrupted. He still demonstrated themselves. So it's not impossible at all, no matter what that Paul says, oh, it's impossible. No, it's just that God's not doing it. And that's not my fault. That I've got nothing to do with that. If, if, if it is impossible for God, then what kind of an omnipotent God is it? A God that's incapable of demonstrating himself to me. Doesn't sound like the God that uh, Paul is promoting there. Um, I never said I needed a miracle. I said that I need reliable, robust, and good evidence. Th this is sort of, um, it it's misleading because Paul asked me, like, what do we expect to see in the world? And I gave him the evidence of the miracles that have happened before. That was what we would expect to see. And then he's saying that's the only evidence I will accept. No, that's not the only evidence I would accept. That is what we expect to see in the world, the question that you asked. So this is then taking that question and applying it broadcloth um, over all the arguments. No, no. As I said, specifically, twice, reliable, robust evidence that has a sound methodology. I don't know how more specific I can get than that. Um, I never said that divine creation is not possible. Um, let's just look at Paul's trilemma. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's a trilemma, but let, let's look at Paul's alternative, supernatural, abiogenesis, and panspermia. Now, the problem comes that I didn't say that I believed in the other two. I dismissed them as well because I don't know if abiogenesis is possible. I don't know if panspermia is possible. So I did dismiss them. I am being consistent. But Paul wants to make it out like I'm only dismissing the supernatural. And by the way, supernatural does not mean God. Supernatural could be supernatural fairies. It could be magic. It could be something else. It, it's this false trilemma that he's sort of saying, hey, if it's not like abiogenesis and panspermia, it's God. What about all the other supernatural things out there? This is another example of somebody using confirmation bias to say, hey, it must be a God if it doesn't fall in the other two categories, which is not the case. I can make an argument for fairies and there's the same evidence for God. Um, and I didn't dismiss a by I, I did dismiss a biogenesis because I don't know that that is the case. The whole idea that panspermia, um, life developing on another planet, the the whole point is that we haven't examined life on another planet. There could be a biogenesis happening on another planet, then coming to Earth. That is panspermia, 
And that one may be perfectly understandable. We may be able to find the natural causes on another planet, or it could have been aliens designing humans on this planet. You can't investigate the aliens, and therefore you can't say that it's a, that it, that it's a um, infinite regress because the aliens could have developed naturally, and we could possibly see that by examining them. But I don't believe it because there isn't enough evidence. I don't believe I, a biogenesis. There isn't enough evidence. I don't believe the supernatural. There isn't enough evidence. All of these things I dismiss. I am being totally intellectually consistent. It's just Paul wants to say, "Well, you believe in a biogenesis, which is simply not true." Um, you know, death, death of Paul, uh, of Peter, sorry. Just because somebody dies for their religion doesn't mean what they believed was true. There's plenty of terrorists that die in planes, you know, bombing things, suicide bombers. Just because they died for their religion does not make it true. Or else you would have to acknowledge that Islam is true, that, that Zoroastrian, that any religion where somebody has martyred themselves for any reason is true. But here's the special pleading again. It's I want my people to die for the just cause, but the other ones, they're just, you know, they're, they're just deluded. Well, who's to say your, your guys weren't deluded as well? Not you, but the other religions say that. And we don't know who to believe. They're all saying the same thing. You're wrong, I'm right, and we don't know who to believe. And you all have the same weight of evidence. Um, it's weird that he said that Mark was outside the scope of this topic because he brought up the book of Mark. Um, the Gospel of Mark. I, I don't know why he would say that. I think that abiogenesis and, you know, some of the other things are outside this topic, but, you know, I'm indulging Paul anyway. I don't know why you would bring up a topic and then claim it's outside the discussion. It's very strange. I, I, I don't know why that is. Um, and and so the prophecies that that were given in Isaiah, they were very, very vague. Um, if if there was only one person ever crucified and Isaiah predicted that, well, you might have a have a have a argument. But they're so vague to apply to a number of different people. There's no way that they lack specificity. And when you're making predictions, it is that specificity that determines whether your prediction is accurate or not accurate. You can go through the prophecies of Notre Dame and attribute all kinds of things to Notre Dame, but it lacks that specificity. And so do the prophecies. I mean, look at the prophecy of Tyr, that Nebuchadnezzar would conquer um, Tyr, and, and it didn't happen. He, he went away empty-handed. And, and so he was sort of went off to conquer somewhere else that he was promised to conquer, and it, he went away empty-handed again. It, it just is these, the prophecies, it, it's called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. You count all the hits and discard all the misses. It is another example of confirmation bias. Um, with the universe, um, if, if it was small, surely there's something that God could put in, in the sky or something that would convince everybody without a doubt. Surely he could write the Ten Commandments in the sky, you know, and have a sphere around the earth with, with the, the Bible written in Hebrew writing in the sky all around the earth, um, multiple languages maybe. I don't know. I'm not God. But uh, the idea that a perfect God would make something to catch the meteorites, and it's completely imperfect. In, in 2019, an, an uh, meteorite called OK2019 went past us and it brushed like it, it, was, it came between us and the moon. And that is ex extremely close. There's been impacts over the centuries. Why would God design a meteorite catcher that just doesn't work properly? It's baffling. This is not the work of an omnipotent God. This is not the work of something with divine perfection. This is this is at best. Um, I mean, I could probably devise a better system than this. This God has cooked up. Um, but what we see is just natural. Um, the natural uh, physics of the universe doing its thing. And you can sort of say, "Hey, it's from a divine being," but it lacks that divinity. It lacks that perfection you would expect to see. Like why black holes? Like. Why do black holes out there? No reason, just God mucking around, I guess. But um, thank you, Donnie. I'll, I'll see the rest of my time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much there, uh, Mark, for that 10-minute negative rebuttal. Excellent debate so far. I really do appreciate it, Paul and Mark. We are now moving into our last portion of the debate before audience questions, which is the second affirmative rebuttal. We've got five minutes for this section. And Paul, 
The five minutes is yours. I'll start the timer on your first word. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this is just to confirm, Donnie, this is the last uh, section of the debate. Five minutes to close. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody again for listening to this debate. And I'm going to do my best to respond as, as, as I can with these last five minutes. But I, I've greatly enjoyed being able to take part here and get to have this conversation with uh, Mark. Now, I think there was a misunderstanding. I didn't say that the whole book of Mark is uh, the whole gospel of Mark is outside our debate. I meant that the the long ending of Mark, which you brought up earlier, uh, is outside the debate. We're not really talking about that. Um, here's the, the biggest problem for what Mark is trying to, to do here. He wants to present no target to aim at by simply not believing anything. But the problem is life is here. We are here. You can look out your window and see the, the great diversity of life that exists. And it had to come from somewhere. It didn't just pop into existence for no reason. That would be ridiculous and illogical. You can't simply take no position. This is an argument about the existence of God. So to try to just take no position on how life got here, to me, is rather disingenuous. And it's just it's a ploy to try to have no target for your opponent to aim at. But life is here. So it either had to come into existence by chance, either here or elsewhere, or it had to be designed. Really, I, I don't believe that is an, in, uh, an inappropriate dilemma, either design or chance. One of those two. You have to take a position. Life is here. If you don't want to take a position, I would suggest don't take a debate either. Uh, now, Peter was an eyewitness. So uh, the issue of the, uh, yeah, we have terrorists who die for their beliefs. They, do, they die for Islam. They were not eyewitnesses. Peter was. And that is why it is not special pleading, as Mark has suggested, but rather it is a case of eyewitness testimony being shown to be very, very much um, genuine uh, by the fact that Peter was not willing to recant. Uh, the specificity of the prophecies is actually very, very high. In the course of this debate, I don't have time to mention every single prophecy in the Old Testament. I have to keep it short. But even if you only appeal to the prophecies that I listed, they are very specific because they talk about the, the Hebrew Messiah. How many people are claimed to be the Hebrew Messiah and then got crucified and had people cast lots for their clothing while they were being crucified, just to just for an example there. And then they were with a rich man in his death. I that that's Joseph of Arimathea. If you actually read the prophecies, they're not as vague as Mark would like to have you believe. They are actually very astonishingly specific. And so I don't feel that he's uh, done the job of addressing those prophecies tonight. He has refused to address the issue of the origin of life altogether and has just thrown up his hands and said, I don't know, but you can't say God did it. And as it, as it uh, pertains to the universe, uh, the universe uh, had to have a beginning because it is impossible to count up to infinity. And for that same reason, you can't count down from infinity. The fact that we've reached the present moment shows us that time did have a beginning. Whatever begins has a cause. And I'm not really sure that Mark wants to dispute that the universe has a cause. He's just not willing to allow us to go there in our thinking to say that perhaps God is that cause. What I've provided is a cumulative case. Uh, Mark has sort of misrepresented my evidence as if any one piece of that evidence is supposed to single-handedly prove everything in the Bible. And that's not how it works. In abductive reasoning, in forensics, we look at an overall scope of evidence. And I believe if you do that tonight, and if you uh, are genuine in seeking God, you will find that the evidence points to the Bible being the word of God. Um, so I definitely want to encourage you all to do that for yourselves. Jesus said that if you seek, you will find. He did not say that if you refuse to seek, you will find. 30 in fact, seconds. He said that uh, an, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. 
So uh, what God expects of us is to look at the evidence he has already provided. And I pray that my opponent and all of those in the audience today will uh, do that from the heart. So thank you for your time again. Paul, thank you very much for that second rebuttal. And that wraps up the debate itself, not considering audience questions. Of course, Mark and Paul, great job. I appreciate how fast paced this is in light of the uh, Lincoln Douglas format. So the audience has had a lot of fun. We've got an excellent audience, still over 130 people wow. enjoying this fantastic debate. So Mark and, and Paul, again, great work. And we're going to get into some audience questions. And so for the format, in terms of these questions, what I'm thinking is what we'll do is two minute response. Let's say the questions for Mark, we would make sure Mark gets the last word. We'll say two minutes for Mark, two minutes for Paul. Of course, you don't have to take the full two minutes. And then uh, Mark will get the last minute for a response if he'd like to. And so we'll leave the, the last word up to the debaters. So unless you have any questions, I think we'll just jump right into these audience uh, questions that have come in. Sure. Paul, okay. Got any? No, I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, gentlemen. Again, I really enjoyed that debate. So uh, here we go. Let's start basically from, from the beginning. So first question that has come in comes from Nakia Boyer. Question for Mark. There is a ton of archaeological evidence for biblical accounts in the Bible. Sulfur balls at Sodom and Gomorrah and chariot wheels in the Red Sea. Isn't this more proof than we have for the Big Bang? Mark, go ahead. No, actually, no. And and the chariot wheels in the Red Sea, I don't think I don't think they found definitively Sodom and Gomorrah, much less there's sulfur balls found. Um, there, there are deposits of sulfur, but there's deposits of sulfur all over the area. So it's not really good evidence. The chariot wheels in the Red Sea, look, nobody's found chariot wheels in the Red Sea. In fact, most historians, the historic consensus is that the um the, the people of Israel were never enslaved by Egypt in the first place. There was no exodus. And that's just we have not found any evidence from the Egyptian hieroglyphs or any writings from them that the, the, the Jews were ever enslaved. Um, they believe that Moses was probably a mythological character, never existed. And that's just the consensus of historians. Nobody's ever found any evidence for the Exodus. And I'm, I'm really sorry, but they haven't found chariot wheels in the Red Sea <laughs> determining that that the exodus happened and he parted the Red Sea. I'm, I'm sorry. Appreciate it, Mark. Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, well, just talking about um, Sodom and Gomorrah being hit by meteorites, if I understood Mark correctly in his debate, uh, he would interpret those as evidence against God because God apparently is not allowed to allow meteorites to hit the planet, uh, or otherwise that's evidence against God. So that that's a, a problem there as far as evidence for the exodus there's a really good um relatively new series that was put on a, a documentary series called patterns of evidence the exodus i encourage uh, everybody watching to check that out if you want to see some really good powerful evidence for the exodus okay thank you very much there paul mark you get the last minute go ahead yeah, so so uh, you know, I, I didn't say that Sodom and Gomorrah were meteorites. That's just a you know blatant sort of misunderstanding of what I've said. Um, I, I don't know that it even happened. It is mythological stories. It is things that people just said happened. There is no evidence for these things actually happening. So I don't see why I have to attribute this to to anything. Um, because there isn't evidence that it actually did happen in the first place, any more than Poseidon knocked down the walls of Troy with waves. You know, we don't have any evidence of that happening either. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have to address it at all. Thank you very much, Mark and Paul and Nakia. Appreciate the question. Moving on to question number two, comes in from Apologetics 101. Question for Mark. What justification do you have for a standard of objective morality? This is my question for his argument on the problem of evil. Mark, go ahead. 
Right. So I don't I don't see a, a objective morality as existing. I don't see any reason for it. I don't see any need for it. Um, we can make um, uh, relativistic frameworks um, to achieve goals that society wants. We can we can basically assign a goal to our societies and therefore get objective um, objective. Uh, ethical decisions in relation to those goals. But I don't see why we, I don't see anything. Let me just couch that. I would love if there was some sort of objective morality that transcended all sort of thought framework and all minds. But I see no reason that that should exist or does exist. It doesn't seem like it does. Um, nobody can demonstrate this objective morality and they all disagree on what the objective morality is. So people all sort of claim to have objective morality, which is all different. It's this variability that shows that there probably is no objective morality at all. So I don't have a justification for objective morality. I don't need it. Thank you, Mark. Paul, the floor is yours. Um, well, just off offhand, you know, if there is no objective morality, then there is also no problem of evil. Um, but as it turns out, there is objective morality. If you read, um, I believe it's the it's from the abolition of man. I'm pretty sure it's it's either that or mere Christianity, one of those two. Um, so I'm sorry if I get it wrong. It's one of those two. But C.S. Lewis addressed this issue of objective morality, and I think he laid out a very persuasive case uh, by looking across uh, many many different cultures there is a core basis of certain objective morality uh, or agreed upon um, moral standards across cultures. So Marx claimed that all the, you know, everybody disagrees on what objective morality is. That's actually not the case. I believe C.S. Lewis called it the Tao, uh, but whatever you call it, there is broad agreement on uh, some basic ideas of, of objective morality. So uh, there's very good evidence for it. And the fact that atheists keep trying to use the problem of evil against God shows that uh, they, in fact, also believe in morality. Thank you for the response, Paul. Mark, the question's for you. You get the last minute. Yeah, um, this is interesting. And I'd also, like, thanks for reminding me, it brings up that you didn't actually address the problem of evil at all. Like, you didn't actually address why a benevolent God, you know, allows these things to happen. But anyway, um, and yeah, it's a problem for theists because um, God is supposed to be benevolent. Yes, all, you know, all these horrible things happen. I mean, he may not have, you know, caused parasites, but he definitely flooded the world. Um, so there is definitely the problem of evil out there. Um, sort of C.S. Lewis saying that we see these intrinsic things throughout cultures is more more um, a, a demonstration that people think alike, not that there is anything objective behind that. Um, the Aztecs, for instance, sacrifice people en masse. You can't say that, that they, they have the same objective morality as the Europeans did in a very warm, loving tribe. You just can't. Um, they had a very different idea of what was moral and what wasn't moral, different different ideas of, of and, and we even have different ideas of what is moral and what is not moral between cultures today. Um, there is no demonstration through this. In fact, the, the fact that morality is so variable across disparate cultures is evidence against an objective morality, not evidence for it. So that C.S. Lewis thing, I, I don't hold him very high regard um, as, as far as uh, that kind of thing goes. Thank you very much for the last word there, Mark. Next question comes in from Taylor K. Mark, I appreciate you being a good sport tonight. Most questions are for you. And so mm -hmm. Taylor has a question for you. What acted on the singularity to make it start rapidly expanding and how long did it exist before the Big Bang? Okay, so two thoughts on that, uh, Taylor. Um, firstly, I'll address the second section last. So before the Big Bang may be a nonsensical question, and that's not to do with you. It's just um, if you have the Big Bang as the origin of space-time, so the origin of our universe and the origin which is intrinsically meshed with time, it's not something else. It's the same thing as space. It is space-time. It's the same thing. Um, when they are intrinsically meshed, 
saying before time existed kind of doesn't make any sense because there is no before if you don't have time before. Now, it could be that something acted upon it. It could be natural. It could be a god. We don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody can demonstrate that. They just claim to know. Um, so, and it may be that with that compression of space, and when you compress space, time gets longer and slower. So with that compression of space, that Big Bang singularity, uh, before it started expanding, that moment, that one moment could have lasted an eternity. So that is an eternal universe, one that did not start expanding. I believe um, astronomers like um, Sean Carroll is a proponent of this, and he um, is slowly gathering a lot of support for this idea that um, the, the moment before the singularity was an eternal moment due to the compression of space-time. So, um, but at the end of the day, we don't know. Appreciate it, Mark. Paul, over to you for your response. Now, I would certainly agree that um, if you if you use the word before uh, as it as it pertains to the beginning of time itself, that could present a problem since the word before implies time. Uh, but the as it pertains to the Kalam cosmological argument, it's not an issue of of time. It's an issue of causation. So uh, I would agree. We don't say before time. But we do still have the issue of causation that we have to address. Something had to cause something to begin to exist. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now, a lot of uh, people are trying to do double speak here and saying, well, it had a beginning, but the beginning was eternal. I, I don't think that's coherent. If it's eternal, it would be ongoing and, and the Big Bang would not have happened. The fact that it ended means that by definition, it was not eternal. So I think we're, we're playing word games here when, when we say something like that. The fact is, time uh, had a beginning, uh, and it was a finite amount of time ago. So uh, the universe began to exist, and it, needed, it needs a cause. Appreciate it, Paul. Mark, you get the last word. Yeah, so we're not playing word games. We're just examining the physics of what happens when time is compressed. There's no no word games here. It's just it's just our understanding one plank second or one infinitesimal second. All of physics breaks down. So it is possible for that to happen. Now, I'm not a cosmologist. The problem with the Kalam, and here's here's Paul's main problem, is the Kalam, and and he didn't address this. Doesn't mention God in any of the premises or the conclusion. It just said the universe has a cause. So if you follow, say, M theory, mem brain theory. Um, it postulates a 11-dimensional uh, multiverse that has these membranes and they occasionally clash. So is there time outside the universe in a larger cosmos outside the universe? We don't know. Can things naturally occur in there? M theory has the math that says that works in 11 dimensions. Um, we don't know for sure, but that is one naturalistic explanation of how a universe could pop into existence from membranes colliding that causes this event to happen. It is a cause. It's not a god. And that's where the conflation is occurring. Paul wants to say if the universe had a cause, it is God. And none of the Kalam makes that assertion. It only says it had a cause, and that's all. Like the, a cause doesn't equal God automatically. It could be a naturalistic cause, but sort of Paul wants to skip over that and just say, well, cause equals God. No, no, not at all. And that's even if me membrane theory is correct, which we're not sure. This whole idea, if we don't know something, I'm ducking and dodging. We just don't know. Why is it a, I'm taking a position by saying I don't know something? That is a position in and of itself. It's, it's the whole, the argument is not where the universe came from or life came from. The debate is evidence for a God. Just because I don't know something is not evidence for a God. That is God of the gaps. That is horrendous God of the gaps. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Okay. Thank you for the responses from the both of you. Next question comes in from Baked Alaska at SFT. Does Mark believe the universe is necessary or contingent? If contingent, 
then what is it contingent on? Um, I think after watching a lot of the um, things presented by cosmologists that I kind of lean towards it being necessary, that the the starting point of compressed space-time was eternal. Um, I don't know that for sure, so I, I, I'm not sure I believe that 100%. I think that I don't know. If it is contingent, I would probably think that it's contingent like membrane theory is correct or m theory is correct and it is membranes colliding in 11 dimensional space or or you know sort of the the whole multiverse thing that it is something in the cosmos outside that is causing it. um the reason why is because um unfortunately throughout the debate paul did not actually demonstrate how a mind could exist outside of a brain um i think i think sort of skipped over that completely and didn't address it so that's why um, I would think natural causes before some sort of mind that exists without a brain in the universe somewhere doing all these things, even though there's no time to do it. And it doesn't seem likely to me. But uh, the, really, I don't know the answer to that question. Appreciate it, Mark. Paul, floor Cheers. is yours. Uh, yeah, so Mark has mischaracterized the arguments that I've made. I understand, of course, that the Kalam cosmological argument does not single-handedly prove the existence of God. It was never designed to do that. It's one piece of evidence. When we're doing abductive reasoning, we're looking at our overall scope of evidence, and we're making an inference to the best explanation. The fact that the universe needs a cause is one of those data points. And we put that together with the fact that life exists and the fact that fulfilled prophecy exists and many others. These are just the, t the ones I had time to mention tonight. Uh, and we do an abductive reasoning. We infer uh, inference to the best explanation that God is that best explanation. Uh, but I'm sorry, if you just want to come to a debate and just say over and over that you don't know, I would just suggest that that's not really debating. It's just simply not having a position. So I'm here. I'm here to defend a position tonight. And that position is that the evidence supports the existence of God. Um, and and I, I would again just have to say, saying something was eternal, but it's no longer eternal, is a contradiction of terms. It, it just simply is. If it was eternal, then the Big Bang did not happen, and, and we're not here now. Um, and I don't believe in the Big Bang, but, but to claim that uh, uh, something was eternal and then it ceased to be eternal and then something came after it is just illogical. Thank you, Paul. Mar uh, Mark, you get the last minute. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so, so first, you know, why I shouldn't be at this debate. Uh, I am here to talk, you know, debate the topic of the debate, which is evidence for God. If you want to debate abiogenesis, maybe you should set the topic of the debate as abiogenesis or the origin of the universe or any of the other things that I don't have an answer for. This this isn't, I do have a position on is there evidence for God? And my position is no, there is not. Sort of po pointing out a gap in my knowledge doesn't make it evidence. And, and sort of saying, well, don't turn up to a debate if you don't have a position on these un, sort of these topics that are tran, uh, uh, um, tangential to the main topic is kind of a bit dishonest because you've come into a debate about the evidence of God and then criticized me on not having answers for other topics that we're not debating. I mean, I, I don't know what you expect, but if you want to debate about abiogenesis, make a debate on abiogenesis. Why aren't we debating abiogenesis? Because that's not what you wanted to debate. So, you know, I think that that's very, very spurious to say the least. Um, so, uh, you know, your misunderstanding of cosmology doesn't make um, an eternal universe um, un, un, you know, impossible or anything like that. I mean, I, I do expect you to write up a paper and challenge Sean, Sean Carroll on his understanding of cosmology. I certainly wouldn't do that, but, you know, you apparently know more than him, so have at it. Um, you know, these are physicists and people that study cosmology for their life's work that you're criticising here. And I haven't committed to them 100% because I don't know and, and you're sort of criticizing me for not having the knowledge that you're asserting without evidence. So, you know, I, I, I don't see that as, as particularly constructive, and it is God of the gaps. And also this whole thing of we infer, we use abductive reasoning, but the problem is you're using something called the... 
Texas sharpshooter, you're dismissing all the other things, could be interdimensional, uh, interdimensional aliens, could be magic, could be all these other things, yet you drop them with no justification because you're basically using confirmation bias for your God. Thank you very much, Mark and Paul, for the responses. So moving on, we got a couple questions for you now, Paul. I was wondering one. if there would be any. I'm, I'm happy to get <laughs> some, though. We've got some. It's a biased we... audience. Come on now. It's a biased audience. <laughs> <laughs> we've got the, some that we've managed to squeeze in for you, Paul. We don't want Mark being the one having all the fun here. So, But seriously, great job uh, tonight, Mark and Paul. And this one comes in from CC. Question for Paul. Is your deity bound by the laws of physics or can it supersede its own laws? Well, uh, think of it this way. Um under the normal cause, uh, or sorry, under the normal laws of physics, do dead men rise from their graves or do they decompose? So I, if you think about that question, I think you'll you'll realize uh, pretty quickly what the answer to that question is. Obviously, God is not bound by the laws of physics. Otherwise, he would not be able to do any miracles. Thank you very much, Paul. Mark, the floor is yours. Yeah, so so Paul's got a problem here because basically um, God apparently created the universe. He did something before there was time. Now, how does anything do something when there is no time? So Paul's problem is that he's locked in a dichotomy. Either something can be done outside time or it can't be done outside time. If things can be done outside time, there's no reason something else couldn't have happened outside time in the greater cosmos. If something cannot be done within time, then God couldn't have done anything because he cannot act within time. So if you are going to be intellectually consistent, that dichotomy holds true. Either things can be done outside time or cannot be done outside time. And I'd love to hear Paul's answer to that dichotomy. Thank um, you, Mark. Oh, you get the last yeah. word. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question, um, and it gets into some really complicated stuff that um, is over my head, frankly. But uh, there are there's uh, an A and a B B theory of time. William Lane Craig has has written pretty extensively on this topic. If you're interested in researching it, but uh, basically, my view is that. Um, God initiated the, the beginning of time, and God works both in and out of time because he's supernatural. Now, if, if we're not believing in supernatural entities, then, then you have a very different situation uh, because you're limited to what nature is able to do. Uh, and, and I would say that uh, it's just nonsensical from a purely naturalist perspective if you believe like Carl Sagan did, that the universe is all there is and all there ever was and all there ever will be, then to say something happened uh, outside of the universe is contradictory. So we have to be careful about which worldview we're talking about here. In my worldview, God is apart from his creation and he is capable of, he's, got, he's not limited by his creation. He's not limited by time or by the laws of physics. But uh, for a naturalist, uh, you do have to work within those constraints by definition. So uh, I think it's a very different situation there. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. And that question was for you. So we'll give you the last word. Uh, next question comes in from Apologetics 101. And this time it's a question for you, Paul. And he's asking you, what do you, Paul, think about the transcendental argument for the existence of God? Okay. Uh, so that's from ultimately comes uh, goes back to um, Cornelius Van Til and probably the best proponent of it. I mentioned tonight in the debate, Dr. Greg Bonson uh, with his uh, crackers in the pantry fallacy. Um, I like aspects of it. That's why in my first debate, I used an aspect of Dr. Bonson's argumentation when I talked about the fact that um you know, the uniformity of nature is evidence for God's existence. Uh, but if you want to take it on its own terms, the transcendental argument is that the, the best proof of God is that is the impossibility of the contrary. 
And in my uh, humble opinion, I don't think that those uh, that those guys have been able to demonstrate the alleged impossibility of the contrary. So I wouldn't use the transcendental argument in a full blown sense, but I do think there are really powerful parts of it that are useful, uh, regardless of whether you are an evidentialist apologist uh, or a presuppositionalist apolog uh, apologist. And I would really uh, fall more on the uh, evidentialist side of things, uh, or you might call it uh, verificational presuppositionalism, um, like what Francis Schaeffer was, uh, was known for doing. Uh, so I'm really more on that side in terms of how I view apologetics. So I wouldn't use the transcendental argument in itself because I think it I think it tries to do too much. It tries to be the be all end all uh, of apologetics, and I don't I don't think it is that. Okay, I appreciate it, Paul. Mark, floor is yours. Yeah, it, it's a terrible argument. It's actually one of the worst out there. Um, it, it's used by presuppositions everywhere. So people that presuppose that sort of intelligibility, um, morality, these certain things come from God. The problem is that it's a presupposition and everyone makes presuppositions like you have to in order to function in this world, make presuppositions. I presuppose that my senses are you know, correct and generally accurate to a given level of accuracy. That's something I presuppose because the only way I can demonstrate that is through my senses, circular arguments. So I have to presuppose that. Um, the problem comes that you only can uh, you can't really, you don't really have a foundation for a presupposition. And if people challenge that presupposition, if people say, hey, prove that's right, you can't. So it's sort of baseless. Um, we kind of agree that this world is reality and that we operate within it and things like that. Um, there is the, the problem of induction. We kind of presuppose that induction is true. People can challenge that and that's fine. Then don't use induction. Very easy answer. Um, but um, the whole idea that you're presupposing with a god the whole idea of presuppositions is you presuppose as little as possible so you can get a good foundation for what is true and what is not true if you want to presuppose a god you're, you're overreaching you're, you're basically asserting something that is not true and you don't have a foundation for it and and there's no way you can demonstrate it so it, it's a terrible argument because it basically is begging the question you're assuming the existence of god in your statement and and you know the first premises for the tag is something like because morality depends on god it's like well you're begging the question right there thank you very much for that response mark paul question was for you you get the last minute go ahead yes um so i think uh, mark has somewhat misunderstood the problem of induction as i and that's not an argument I used tonight in, in, the, in this debate. I did use it in my uh, original debate. The problem of induction isn't that we don't use induction or we shouldn't use induction, because we all do. The problem is that the fact that we can do induction points to the existence of a lawgiver who upholds this universe in a stable, uniform way that is understandable and predictable. So atheists have to do a whole lot of presupposing. They have to presuppose the uniformity of nature. They have to presuppose uh, morality, even when they claim that they don't. And they have to presuppose laws of logic. And on down the line, all of these have to basically be brute facts for them. Whereas uh, with the Christian, we have one presupposition, that is the triune God, the one true God. And from that flows everything else. And when, when we talk about, like, for example, Occam's razor, we're looking for, that's why scientists are looking for the so-called theory of everything. They're looking for something that's going to be the elegant explanation that flows all of these other data points that we have flow from. Well, what these scientists don't understand is that we already have the theory of everything. That is God. They've rejected God. So they're trying to find some other unifying theory of everything, but they can't find it because they've already rejected it. Okay, Paul, thank you for that final word and to the audience as well. I appreciate all the questions and all the questions being on topic. So again, I'll say fantastic debate tonight. Lots of great feedback from our chat. So next question is for Mark from one of your best 
buddies here mark praise i am <laughs> and so he's he's coming at you he's asking can mark tell us how he resolves the demarcation and induction problem in philosophy yeah, so let's correct Paul on, on the problem of uh, induction because the whole idea that the problem is there's a lawgiver is not the problem of induction. Come on, mate. And we don't presuppose all of the things that you said anyway. But anyway, let, let, let me explain. So the whole point is that of induction is that you rely on things happening in a consistent way, an inductive way, in order to show that it is true. Um, but the whole problem with induction, and here's the problem, that we know induction works because it keeps being reliable. Now, when you look at something and it keeps being reliable, you're relying on the, the regularity or the um, reliability of that to know that it's true. So the process you're using to determine that induction is true is in fact induction, right? That's the problem. Not that it comes from some lawgiver. I don't know where you got that from, but that's the problem of induction. So um, at, at a base level, we basically see that the results of induction keeping on working makes it true and reliable. That's how we know it works. However, we have to use induction to know that it will work going on in the future. So we sort of have to presuppose it at a base level that induction does work in order to get that foundation to get there. Um, now, I don't, you know, if you want to think that in, induction is somehow based in God, a lawgiver, I, I mean, you can make that presupposition, but I would challenge you to say, well, I don't believe that you know, demonstrate that, that it's validity, demonstrate that that's actually true, which you, you know, you don't, unfortunately, Paul, you don't demonstrate anything at the moment. You just sort of make arguments and assertions for them. Um, but but how I, where we get around that is we have to, in, in, like, presuppose induction is true. There's a couple of other presuppositions I make, just the, the laws of logic and my senses. And that's all I need to get to rationality and from rationality, the truth. That's all I need. I don't need to presuppose anything more. I don't need to presuppose this massive God with eternal powers and all this magic. Occam's razor says that you shouldn't make things complex or the complex is usually not the correct answer. And I can't think of anything more complex than an omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omniscient God that somehow did everything. Okay, Mark, thank you. And Paul, you also get two minutes. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Right, right. Uh, Occam's Razor states that you should not multiply your explanations beyond what is necessary to explain what you're trying to explain. So, uh, you know, if I see a red chair, I should not suggest without any other evidence that, well, maybe that chair used to be green and then it was sanded down and then it was painted red. Uh, that would fail the test of Occam's Razor because why not just say, it was always red. You don't multiply your explanations beyond what is needed to explain what we see. Uh, when it comes to the issue that I brought up, that's exactly what atheists have to do. You have to presuppose a whole litany of things, whereas if you just say God exists, all of those things flow from God. Uh, the problem of induction, it is circular. You can't say, and without being circular, you cannot say induction works because induction works. And that's what you're doing. And, and we both seem to understand that. Uh, but what you don't understand is that Christians have a way out of that circular problem because, again, the uniformity of nature, and that's what induction requires, flows from the existence of an omnipotent God who upholds his creation from point A to point B in a consistent way that we can understand. And from that, we can make uh, predictions and we can do science and all of that. Uh, so that isn't a circular thing because we're saying God exists and that is the grounding for the use of induction. But the atheist doesn't have that option. So they just say induction works because induction works and it's circular. So that's the problem of induction. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. And Mark, you get the final minute. Go ahead. Yeah, so Paul hasn't solved the problem of induction at all and just doesn't realize it. Um, so we don't 
like presuppose a litany of things we propose only that which is necessary and god just is not necessary there's no reason to presuppose a god no no reason for it at all doesn't doesn't need to be a god and we're not like multiplying explanations like i'm not providing an explanation for induction i'm presupposing it there's there's a big difference i'm not creating fairies to explain away induction and and Keep in mind, fairies or leprechauns or magic or any other thing would work just as well if you replaced it in, in Paul's explanation of the problem of induction. If you say everything flows from fairies, it all magically gets solved. Of course not. How does he know that God has provided a, a, a uniformity of nature? It's because he observes the uniformity of nature. How does he know that is ongoing into the future? Guess what? Abdu induction. He's still trapped in the same thing that everybody else is. He just thinks that um, a magical God gets him an out, which it doesn't. Exactly. Because the only way he can sort of say that the uniformity of nature is a product of God is if nature is uniform. He has to use induction to validate that nature is uniform. Still problem of induction. Okay, Mark, thank you for that final word. And we are going to have to wrap up the Q&A there. We've gone about 35 minutes and we've still only gotten through a fraction of the questions that came in. And so I do want to thank our awesome audience for being so engaged in this important topic. Again, is there evidence for the existence of God? Mark and Paul, to the both of you, excellent job tonight. Got some super chats as well, just showing their support, their love for the uh, program. I did promise Lorraine Drosophilia, uh, $2 super chat. And she says, SFT first super chat. She wants me to say, add a girl. So add a girl, Lorraine, I appreciate that. I'll give one as well. Add a girl. <laughs> add a girl, yeah. <laughs> nice one, Lorraine. <laughs> we'll end it on a good note. And so from both sides in the chat, lots of uh, great feedback. Mark and Paul always come in prepped. They always come in swinging and knowledgeable. So this was definitely one to remember. Uh, Lorraine is giving us some, some laughing faces. So appreciate <laughs> that. She likes to call me the Canadian moderator. So uh, Paul and Mark, again, thank you so much for your time. We are two hours into the debate. So again, I appreciate the time you give to us. Let's get some final words, final thoughts. Mark, uh, we'll start with you. Again, thanks for doing this. And some final words, final thoughts. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I I I think that that people think that you need a God for morality or to live your life or to be happy or whatever. And and you don't. You don't you don't need any of that. There's no reason to presuppose a God. There, there's reasons to presuppose our senses, because that's the only thing we have access to. There's reasons to presuppose logic because it's how we function and communicate in the world. The God doesn't add anything. It doesn't explain anything. Like if you're saying, hey, God did it, it's it's almost like it magic did it or fairies did it or or it's, you know, sort of space interdimensional aliens did it it doesn't actually explain anything what does explain things is to get good reliable solid evidence and the of course the scientific method is the best way of gathering this there you know but even if you're not using the scientific method you need to have objective and reliable ways to gather your evidence so that you're not using confirmation bias so that you're not using special pleading so that you're not convincing yourself as you go along that all the evidence matches and you're discounting all of the evidence that doesn't. Um, you have to be objective whenever you're trying to evaluate reality and believing beforehand and seeking out the evidence that you want to see. There's a reason why we don't do that in science. It's because if you only seek out the evidence that you want, that's all you'll get. And so be intellectually consistent. Apply the same standards to other religions as your own. Apply the same standards to, to other explanations like, like aliens and Bigfoot and all these other things. You'll see that the scientific method and the methods that we have for gathering this evidence, there's a reason why we do what we do. And that is because it is the best way to get to the truth. And this has been demonstrated by science over many, many years. All of our achievements are coming from science. Religion has not discovered anything new about reality over in the last thousands of years. It hasn't added anything to our knowledge. 
the knowledge that they have is the same knowledge they had years ago and the morality they have has changed to catch up with the rest of society so use your rationality use your empiricism use the tools that we have to find out what is real and what isn't thank you Okay, Mark, thank you very much for the final words, final thoughts. Paul, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for doing this. And over to you for some final words and final thoughts. Yeah, I, again, just appreciate everybody being here, uh, participating in the debate. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, appreciate getting to meet Mark. And uh, it's been a very lively and, and fun debate to take part in. So I, I greatly appreciate this opportunity. And uh, to everyone out there, I would just uh, I would tell you what Blaise Pascal said. Uh, you know, there are only two kinds of people that can truly be called wise. Those who are miserable because they don't know God and they are searching for him with all that they have or those who are happy because they have found God. So I hope if you are miserable today because uh, you don't have hope for the future, you don't have hope for uh for eternal life that's what we all want right that's why the transhumanists are trying to upload their consciousness into the internet because they think that will help them get eternal life somehow we're all searching for eternal life the only true way to obtain that is through god and i would say that if you want to be wise you need to search for god even if you think um I don't know what Mark would want to put. I'm not going to speak for him, but I don't know what percentage he would want to put on it. But, um, you know, even if you think that there's only a 0.001% chance that God exists or that there is a God, you would still be rational to seek that God with all of your heart. And God says, if you seek, you will find. Uh, it is not the case that all religions are equal in terms of their evidential support. And if you really go out there and you read the holy books, read them for yourself, look for the evidence and weigh them, you will find that there is a great disparity of evidence in favor of the Christian worldview. So I pray uh, all of you uh, a good night and thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mark, for those final words and final thoughts. Again, thank you for a debate to remember on such an important topic. Very lively, but also very engaging. I appreciate the energy from tonight's debaters, Mark and Paul. To the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate all of the feedback, support, and, of course, questions. So with that, Standing for Truth is out. God bless all. <music>